As I've mentioned before, the patrons really like to vote for strange things from the Permian and Triassic, and this time I deliberately did not give them any of those options to vote on. And so we actually ended up with Dolocaris, and that's really nice. I mean, we started with the very strange Cambrian Opavinia, and now we can return to the Cambrian... It... it's not Cambrian? When is it from? It's Jurassic? Look at it! It's just... it's so bizarre! Wait, the group was only Ordovician to the Cretaceous, so it's not even in the Cambrian? I'm, I'm gonna have to look at the research for this a little more closely. Okay, so Dolocaris was a very strange animal, in part because it came from the Middle Jurassic, and specifically in the La Volt Lagerschatten, which is in France. This is really important, because the Permian-Triassic extinction, which happened millions of years earlier, is when we start to see most modern groups start to dominate the oceans, and most older ones dying off. And that includes the group that does include Dolocaris, because, like we mentioned, they're actually from the Ordovician, at least the first fossils of them. And so there was a lot of time for them to diversify, and then most things like them went extinct during that PT extinction, if not earlier. So the fact that they lived through tells us they were doing something that's a little bit more unique, at least. And what exactly was that? Well, first, we really need to look at this fossil. And that means we can look at the images that the researchers made of it, and they actually labeled many of the parts. And I'm not an arthropod guy, so I'm actually really, really impressed that the researchers were able to identify all of these different parts of this animal. I mean, it's honestly just really impressive what arthropod researchers could do, especially when so many of their fossils are just so busted up. And with that labeled image, you're actually able to make a lot more sense of the animal. I mean, the claws are more labeled, the many legs underneath it are labeled, you can see the entire large shell, and then the massive, massive eyes. And with that in mind, let's actually go a little bit into the eyeball zone and talk about the history of eyes in this group. And that's because a lot of its ancestors and the earliest members of this group didn't have massive eyes. They were much, much smaller. One of the Silurian members of this group is one of the best understood, and that's Thylacaris, and it had its eyes on small stalks. But more importantly for us, we can start to use the name of this group because this animal is what gives the entire group its name, and that's Thylacocephalia. Thylacaris was one of the earliest known of this group, and it actually comes from the Silurian in Wisconsin, but there are some earlier members, such as Inictazoon, which is actually from Scotland and from slightly earlier in the Silurian, but these two geologic landmasses were actually really close during the Silurian, so it's not completely strange to say that these animals would have been in relatively close proximity to one another, at least evolutionarily. There were still millions of years separating them, but it was a very easy distance to cross. There are also two fossils from the Ordovician that helped to show this group was around for quite a good amount of time and starting to diversify very early on and they diversified into two main groups. The first is the Conchylocarida, and I say that one's first mainly because it's not important to our story of what is Dolocaris. Dolocaris was instead a Concavicaridan. This can be told by many of its features that it has in common with other members of this group, such as the very distinctive compound eyes, a small notch that exists between those eyes, and the forward portion of the shell, which points forward much more aggressively than it does in the Conchylocaridans but that still really only gives us an image of where it exists within its own group. It's a lot harder to try and say much more about where they belong in the broader scale of life without more details. And for that, actually, Tolokaris is a really, really great example, because it was so well-preserved, we can tell some very specific features that let us know what it's more likely to be. So first, we can see that it has jointed and segmented limbs, and that makes it an arthropod, which is almost no help, Arthropods are a huge, huge group. It includes things like crustaceans and insects and arachnids and a host of other smaller groups. It's very broad and knowing that it's an arthropod doesn't really help us with any of that. However, there are some features that can help us to narrow it down. For example, it doesn't have large chelicerae and chelicerae are things found in arachnids and some of their relatives like horseshoe crabs. They're essentially just extra limbs that help them feed. In spiders, most famously, they are the fangs of the spider. However, beyond that, there's also the fact that they have compound eyes. While spiders do have eyes, they're really not compound. They're just individual lenses. But since Dolocaris does have a compound eye, that means it's from one of these groups that does have a compound eye. And that limits us to essentially the crustaceans and hexapodes. And hexapodes are just insects and some of their very close relatives that aren't technically insects. So things like springtails is an example. Unfortunately, none of the animals in these modern groups though have the same kind of eye setup as Dolocaris. They don't have 
two massive eyes that are pushed together very, very closely with just a small groove in between them. Instead, the eyes are generally more distinct. And that means we need to look at it even closer. We need to go deeper into the eyeball zone and actually use scanning electron microscopes to look at the structures that were present inside of the eye. And what the researchers who described Dolocaris found when they did this is that the eyes of Dolocaris aren't that much like a hexapode. They actually used a fruit fly as an example. Instead, they're built much more like the eyes of crustaceans, and they use a specific type of shrimp for this, which isn't important. Eyes are generally fairly conservative once they evolve because they're super, super useful. There's not going to be a lot of change happening within them if the animal can avoid it, especially if it does need those eyes. And boy, did it need those eyes. I mean, they were massive, so it was clearly using them, and it was likely using them to hunt, and not necessarily hunt massive things. Dolichares itself was fairly small. The scale bar within the image that shows the fossil is actually only one centimeter, so this thing was pretty darn minute. But just because it's small doesn't mean that it would have been bad at hunting. In fact, in the fossil that is preserved, the same scanning electron microscope was able to identify parts of the animals inside of its stomach tract. And specifically, it found other crustaceans, including some small shrimp, inside of that stomach tract. So this animal was definitely hunting, and it was hunting other crustaceans even. So you can start to tell at least something about what it would have been doing based on its eyes and what we did find in its stomach. And so because they found all this information about what Dolocaris was doing, the authors were able to propose a pretty simple, although slightly variable hypothesis for what Dolocaris was likely doing. It either potentially stayed near the sea floor using those large eyes to keep a lookout for prey, or it may have swam and hung out in rocks in more rocky environments and looked out for prey. Then it was probably an ambush hunter and would swim rapidly up towards that prey like a small shrimp, grab it, and then feed on it. Of course, Dolocaris itself would also need to keep an eye out for itself, and that's because there's a lot of other animals that have been found in this Lagerstaten that would have absolutely eaten Dolocaris including one of the first octopodes. So one of the first octopi was found in this Lagerstaten, as well as some things like belemnites, which are squid-like animals, and some fish, all of which would absolutely eat Dolocaris. I mean, a nice small crunchy crustacean, as long as you can get past the shell, it's really not the worst. So it did keep that shell for protection, although once animals got large enough, it only served so much protection. But it is important that it had that shell, because it probably helped to keep some of the smaller individuals of those animals more at bay, rather than it just being constantly under threat, it at least had some defenses. And so what this means is while Dolocaris seems very, very strange, it seems also like it was just a crustacean trying to live its best life. It was doing different things the same way modern species evolved. It was trying to make sure it could identify prey, grab it with its claws, and feed. It was trying to make sure it was protected from other animals attacking it. It's really not that different from modern day crustaceans. But unfortunately for Dolocaris and the other Thylacocephalians, they died out during the Cretaceous, and potentially even the very end Cretaceous extinction. A giant rock hit the planet, the ocean ecosystems collapsed, and Dolocaris and its relatives just couldn't make it. And that's largely because it takes more than just claws and a shell to become as successful as crabs are.